Kierkegaard's rules. Okay, so we just have one goal for this session. We're going to talk about what are known as Kierkegaard's rules. There's the junction rule and the loop rule. And essentially, there are really familiar conservation laws applied to circuits. So let's start off with the junction rule. So in the picture, we have a snippet of a circuit. It's not the whole circuit, it's just a piece of a circuit where there's two resistors, a 2-ohm resistor and a 3-ohm resistor, in parallel with one, with one another. You can tell they're in parallel because you can see the current coming in, splitting, and then recombining. Okay, so a junction is a place where three or more current paths meet, and so we have two junctions in this particular uh, picture here, marked in red. You can see current I comes into that junction on the left and splits up into I2 and I3. Or, if you look at the picture on the right, current I2 and I3 flow into that junction and I goes away. Okay, so the junction rule simply says the total current coming into a junction equals the total current going out from a junction. So that's really uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, if you have two amps coming in, you got to account for that two amps someplace. Okay, so, and again, the current I comes in, splits into I2 through the 2-ohm resistor and I3 through the 3-ohm. So the junction rule tells us that I equals I2 plus I3. Note that we get exactly the same equation whether we look at the left junction or the right junction. They give us the same thing. So, what do you think the fraction is of the current I that passes through the 2-ohm resistor? So, you might want to pause there or just see what you think. Alright, so the answer turns out to be 3 fifths, and we're going to prove that. So, Let's just make, we'll do a general analysis here. So instead of doing a 2 ohm and a 3 ohm, a specific case, we'll do R2 and R3 in parallel. We'll do the more general case. Okay, so what we know about resistors in parallel is that they have the same potential difference across them. So that means delta V is IR, and you can use IR for either resistor, right? So delta V across that parallel pair is I2R2. It's also I3R3. Okay, so there's one equation we've got. Then we've got our junction equation, I is I2 plus I3. So we can solve that for I3 and then put that expression in for I3 in the delta V equation. Okay, so that gets us I2 R2 is I3 R3, but I3 is I minus I2. So it's I2 R2 is I minus I2 R3. We've eliminated I3 from that equation, which allows us to solve for I2. So we put the I2 terms together, we'll put the I term on the other side, we solve for I2, and we get I2 is I multiplied by this fraction, R3 over R2 plus R3, and it turns out that I3 is I multiplied by a very similar fraction, R2 over R2 plus R3. So this works for two resistors in parallel. So the fraction of the current that flows through one of the resistors is the other resistance divided by the sum of the two resistances. Okay, so in this case we'll get, uh, if we do the 2 and the 3 ohms, then our denominator is 5 ohms, and I2 ends up being 2 ohms, sorry, 3 ohms over 5 ohms, 3 fifths of I, and I3 is 2 ohms over 5 ohms times I, in other words, 2 fifths of I. So we've accounted for all of I. Okay, so what do you think? The junction rule is actually a conservation law in disguise. In effect, represents conservation of, well, we've got a rule about conservation of charge. So a certain, certain amount of charge coming into a junction, you've got to account for all that charge. You can't magically have charge disappear at the junction or magically add charge from nowhere. So all the charge coming in has to equal the amount flowing out. Okay, so the second rule we're going to look at is what we call the loop rule. And... What that is, it says the sum of all the potential differences around a closed loop equals zero. If we express that in the form of an equation, we get this. The sum of all the delta v's equals zero for a complete loop. So when a charge goes around a complete loop, its potential energy has to be the same as when it started that loop, so when it gets back to the same point. So if we imagine positive charges going around a circuit, then they gain energy when they go through batteries, and they give up that energy to resistors as they pass through them. Remember, we have a lovely ski hill analogy for this, where the chairlift is the battery, skiers are the charges, ski trails are the resistors. 
Okay, so here's our ski hill analogy. So we've got a battery there acting as a chairlift, and what that is doing is lifting the skiers or the charges up to the top of the hill, and then they flow down through this one trail here, and then the, you can have a choice there. You can go to the left trail or the right trail to get the rest of the way down. The left trail is a little bit higher resistance than the one on the right, so not as many skiers or charges choose that path. More charges slash skiers choose the path of least resistance, the easier trail, and uh, they take that route back to the, the bottom. Okay, but then all those charges or skiers come back together at the bottom of the hill, and the battery slash ski lift lifts them back up again. Okay, so here is the same kind of thing applied to a circuit. So we've got a positive charge there. It gains energy going through the battery and then loses some energy going through that first resistor. It chooses one of the paths, in this case it goes through the top branch, loses some more energy going through there. And then our model is that the, the wires here are zero resistance paths, so we've got the charge then flows simply back to the battery and the cycle repeats again. Okay, so let's apply the loop rule to this circuit. And our goal is to determine the current from the battery. And remember, we could do this another way. We could collapse the circuit down to a single resist, equivalent resistor and expand it back up again, but we're going to do it this way instead. Okay, so we're going to choose a loop, complete loop around the circuit. Uh, we could have gone through that 3 ohm resistor, but we didn't. We went through this one outlined in green. Some guidelines. When you go from the minus terminal to the positive terminal across a battery, then you get a positive delta V. Magnitude is equal to the battery voltage. If you go through a resistor in the same direction as the current, well, current flows downhill, so you get a negative delta V. Magnitude I times R. If you go the other way, then you flip the signs. Okay, so remember delta V equals zero. Some of all the delta Vs is zero for a complete loop. If we start at the bottom left corner of the circuit and go clockwise, then we go across the battery from minus to plus, plus 16 volts is our change in potential. We lose I times 2 ohms going through that uh, first resistor, and then the current splits, so we only get 3 fifths of I going downhill through the 2 ohm resistor, so we get minus 3 fifths I times 2 ohms. And then we go back to the battery, nothing else in between, so we say equals 0. Note that if we went through the other path, we would have gone 2 fifths of I times 3 ohms, and of course that's the same as 3 fifths of I times 2 ohms. Okay, so you can solve that nicely for the current. The whole current in the circuit, you get 5 amps. And that means uh, 3 amps is going through the 2 ohm resistor and 2 amps is going through the 3 ohm resistor. All right, so that's another way to do a solution to find current, and then we could find voltage and power or whatever we want. Okay, so in some ways this is a conservation law in disguise, and it is conservation of, and I would say it's energy. Okay, so that is it for this one.